U.S. nat gas prices continued to decline last week, with traders defending the key $2 support level. The market has been in a prolonged downtrend since June 11, leading some analysts to call for selling. However, this strategy carries significant risks at current levels. Intensifying heat may boost natural gas futures in early trading next week. Weather analysts report that hot high pressure will dominate most of the U.S. through early next week, with highs ranging from the upper 80s to 100s. This pattern is expected to drive very strong national demand over the next seven days. The latest EIA report showed a smaller-than-expected storage build of 18 billion cubic feet for the week ending July 26, compared to the five-year average of 33 billion cubic feet. Moreover, the next four reports are expected to be bullish again, meaning that the current storage surplus compared to the five-year average will narrow from 441 to 389 billion cubic feet. While bearish factors persist, including high storage levels and delayed LNG export capacity, the current technical setup and strong near-term demand suggest caution for sellers. The market may be approaching a bottom, with potential for a short-term bullish reversal if weather forecasts hold and storage builds remain below average. Halfway through the summer, U.S. nat gas prices have struggled to gain momentum. Listen to the team of market analysts as they discuss the supply and demand factors influencing the market and where natural gas prices may be heading into the winter and beyond. Kevin, let's go ahead and start with prices. We're about halfway through the core of summer when it's hottest, um, and we've only got really about a month left before some parts of the country start to cool down. So can you run us through where natural gas prices are currently, what's brought us up to this point, and where prices may be heading in the coming months? Sure. So we're talking on the last day of July, and as we speak right now, Front month September natural gas futures are down slightly, just above the two dollar level. That's been pretty much the uh, the resistance level for much of the last several weeks. At two dollar level, um, going back to the August contract that expired earlier this week. Uh, while there's been a lot of heat, June was above average. July has been above average. Forecast for August are to be above average. We've had just enough bearish factors to offset that weather and keep both futures and cash prices largely in check. Um, NGI's national average on the cash price front is has been hovering below two dollars and about 25 percent below year earlier levels when we had roughly similar uh, uh, amounts of uh, cooling demand. So what's been at play, a number of factors, the weather has been offset just enough in key regions at times with rainy conditions in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast at other points in South Texas with um, cooling air and, and power outages caused by Hurricane Barrel and, and early July. That hurricane also um, had an impact on uh, LNG send outs and of, of course knocked offline uh, Freeport LNG in South Texas. That, uh, that affected about two BCF per day, the, the Freeport challenges for that affected about two, two BCF per day for a good chunk of July. That's come back online, but at the same time, Production throughout July is held around the 102 BCF per day level, according to Wood McKenzie data. That's way up from spring lows in the mid 90s BCF and more of an average heading into June that was closer to 100 or just shy of 100 BCF per day. So the production has been strong. The weather has been equally strong at times, but not quite in key portions of the country, key gas consuming areas like the upper Midwest and the Northeast. And then of course, uh, the hurricane had, had a, an impact for a, a expanded stretch in July as well. So the net effect has been that supply has, has remained robust, outstripping demand, keeping pressure on prices, both on the futures market and uh, uh, on the cash market. So heading into August, like I said, there's a forecast, the National Weather Service forecasts are calling for above average heat across the 
most of the country for most of the month. And um, some some new forecasts from AccuWeather are showing above average heat through the fall as well. So there is a, uh, there are some serious bullish undercurrents uh, that could mark a shift as we move into August here, especially if there is any movement on, on the production front, movement lower, that is. So, but as we stand right now, storage, underground storage, along with the strong production is at hefty levels. Uh, as the um, storage relative to the five-year average stood at 16% in, in late July. It was expected to come down a little bit as we head into August, but uh, we're really dependent on that August heat coming through and production not moving up further in the, the last third of what is sort of the traditional summer. Right. Well, no doubt. I mean, traders and, you know, other market observers will be really watching that August weather demand to gauge the trajectory of storage levels, you know, as we head into the fall. And I guess it's good news for natural gas bulls that, you know, that that heat is expected to continue throughout August and into September and, and possibly into October. So, Jody, obviously, there's also risks associated with any long term weather forecast and and certainly Houston has gotten its share of storms recently, um, the Vedecho in May. And then, of course, we had Hurricane Burl in July, certainly cooled things down some here. But of course, the heat returned with a vengeance. So how's the summer shaking out? I mean, I'm just here on the Gulf Coast, so I know what's going on here. But what about the rest of the country? What How's the summer been shaking out for, for other regions? And what can we expect here for the rest of the summer? Well, weather has been pretty crazy uh, so far this summer. It's uh, been kind of a mixed bag. So as you and Kevin alluded to, temperature-wise, it's been pretty hot. Uh, so particularly for California, the season has been a scorcher because um, according to meteorologists, the heat dome trapped hot air over the state and that's in temperatures soaring well into the 100 degrees. But of course, California wasn't alone. On the opposite coast, the heat wave also sent temperatures in cities uh, from New England to the Mid-Atlantic into the triple digits. In fact, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, is saying that hundreds of cities in nearly every state, including um, Alaska and even in Hawaii, track for one of their 10th warmest summers on record. So the weather situation was slightly different in Texas, as you mentioned. Uh, although it dealt for a large part of the season with the same heat, it also got a one-two punch early, um, I believe on July 8th, when a hurricane barrel slammed into the coast. Um, it hit as a category one storm and it hit Houston almost directly and knocked out power to about 2.2 million people. Most of them were customers of Centerpoint Energy. Centerpoint said that power lines were damaged by fallen trees and a lot of poles went down. And that took the utility more than a week to return service to all of its customers. And as uh, Kevin mentioned, Freeport Liquefaction Facility, which is located about 70 miles south of Houston, that remains set for, I believe, more than a week. But Chris will talk about that a little bit later. As you can imagine, the center point had a lot of explaining to do, and um, it's promised to significantly increase its vegetation management. That would include trimming tree branches and you know, to prevent the same issues from barrel. And uh, one of the greatest frustrations for its customers was that the utility's outage tracker was down through the storm. So Centerpoint said that it's going to launch a new tracker, hopefully um, by August 1st. And hopefully that will help ease frustrations when other storms hit. So on that front, the National Hurricane Center is currently monitoring an area of disturbed weather in the Central Atlantic. That storm has a 60% chance of development over the next seven days, but it's projected on a path to threaten Florida, not the Gulf Coast. So far, NOAA's outlook for the 2024 Atlantic hurricane season appears pretty accurate. Um, the season spans from June 1st to November 30th, and NOAA predicts uh, an 85% chance of an above normal season. It's forecasting a range of 17 to 25 total named storms, and those would be storms with winds of 35 miles per hour or higher. 
Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, hopefully the Gulf Coast has already seen the worst of hurricane season. Surely we don't want damage hitting any part of the United States, but there's obviously a lot of LNG demand on the Gulf Coast that could significantly alter the landscape for the natural gas market. But given the all the heat that we've had this summer, obviously one would expect the market to be in a much better sword situation than it was at the beginning of the injection season. And as Kevin said, we've got, you know, lofty storage levels. And that's really one of the reasons that we've seen natural gas prices struggle to maintain any momentum. Jody, are you seeing, you know, what, what else are we seeing on the storage front? And how, how is that part of the supply situation shaping up for the winter? How are the, I guess, injections expected to come in here through the rest of the summer? And I don't know if it's kind of early yet, but I don't know if you're seeing any early projections yet for the winter withdrawal season. Yeah, so even with the extremely hot weather across the country, natural gas inventories are still above historical averages, and that's a worry for the market. Um, The latest storage report from the U.S. Energy Information Administration covered the weekend of July 19th, and that showed a 22 BCF injection which compared with an increase of 23 BCF for the same time last year, a 31 BCF five-year average build brought the total working gas supply to 3,231 BCF, which is still 249 BCF higher than last year, um, and 456 BCF above the five-year average. So uh, weekly natural gas inventories have been overall light compared to a year ago and five-year average withdrawals, but the total supply is contracting at a pace that the market sees as too slow. Even with the further reductions in surplus through the remainder of the summer injection season, the IA is looking at a surplus in storage at the end of the fall shoulder season, which is October 31st, to be about 3.9 BCF. So that would still be 6% above the five-year average and 4.4% more than the inventories at the end of the 2023 injection season. So still a worry for inventories. And I haven't heard any specific talk about winter, but a cold one could drive natural gas demand for heating. And then LNG projects are supposed to be coming online and that could help ease the supply. But of course, uh, production will also play a part and a combination of increased producer activity and a mild winter won't bode well for the market. Right. No, certainly not. LNG demand certainly is a hot topic in the natural gas market, you know, not just because of the coming demand, but also because of some key issues that we've seen at one of the Gulf Coast facilities here in recent months. Chris, you've been following the Freeport challenges. So what's been going on there and and have things returned to normal yet? Yes, as mentioned, uh, Freeport was knocked offline for, for around a week after Barrow. Uh, unfortunately for them, they're one of the few terminals on the Gulf Coast that does not generate their own power. They had to wait, a, wait for Centerpoint to restore uh, service uh, before they can start, start repairs. Um, but we saw them uh, over the past few weeks ramp up one train and their second train. And all, all three trains now have been running since this past weekend. We're speaking uh, here on uh, July 31st. And so, uh, yeah, Freeport's back to full strength, running above two BCF per day. And with that recovery at Freeport, we've seen overall LNG feed gas flows uh, bounce back to about 13 BCF per day. That's about where they've paced this year. So back to back to normal for, for all the U.S. Uh, and North America. And for perspective, that's around 10% of overall U.S. natural gas demand. Uh, Letty, uh, we, and, uh, Jody, you mentioned uh, the new capacity coming online. Uh, I just spoke with our uh, LNG team just to get a good feel for this, um, for how much we could be seeing uh, you know, by the end of the year. We're watching Plaquemines in Louisiana start to slowly ramp up. There was some excitement you know, with the analysts and traders seeing those flows start to appear this past uh, past month. Rough guess on that for the first phase, uh, we could see another one BCF per day of additional LNG uh, by the end of the year there. But some of that, the startup activities could spill over into next year as they work through issues. Um, We also saw Altamira in Mexico produce its first LNG in July. 
So that's slowly coming on and expected to you know, send out their first LNG export cargo soon. Also, uh, LNG Canada in British Columbia, uh, they may see uh, feed gas demand start up in the fall. So that's going to be a slow ramp up with exports not expected until uh, mid next year. So really uh, some excitement for the LNG ramp up, but the, uh, the inflection point that we're really expecting, a lot of that's not gonna happen until 2026. Another potential upside though, I should say for the end of next, this year, Corpus Christi stage three in South Texas, they could start producing. But again, for them, they're not expected to be fully online until 2026. Another uh, LNG terminal in the news uh, uh, that's important, Golden Pass, we're not expecting them to come online until 2026. I know Golden Pass is still guiding for 2025, um, but it really is a moving target. They've obviously had setbacks. Uh, work at the site is restarting. The site is flooded, and that was before Barrel came through. But they've had the bankruptcy resolved, and one of their primary contractors is exiting, and so they can restart work. Um, but it's still early innings for the next leg higher in LNG capacity. Looking at our uh, NGI North American LNG export project tracker, we see 11 BCF per day under construction. That's uh, due to come online by the end of the decade. Yeah, well, yeah, certainly a lot of moving parts here for the LNG industry. And you mentioned Altamira in Mexico and LNG Canada. Obviously, you know, those are North American projects, but they're so critical to the U.S. market because the LNG projects that are being built in Mexico, those are being fed by Permian Basin supplies. And then you've got LNG Canada. And while those facilities are being fed by Western Canadian natural gas, that is going to have an impact on the U.S. markets since we might see reduced imports into the United States from Canada as those LNG facilities continue to come online. But generally speaking, we've got a lot of LNG demand coming online here in the United States alone um, in the next few years. And so that's really what the market is banking on to drive significant demand for years to come. Now, of course, this is precisely why we've seen production remain stubbornly high in the face of wheat gas prices. Now, we did see a pullback earlier this year, but, you know, as Kevin mentioned, some of that has of that supply has returned to the market. And now notably, we are in the thick of the second quarter earnings uh, season. And so we're starting to hear from the producers themselves of their plans for the rest of the year. Kevin, what can you tell me about some of the trends that you're seeing in production and, and how that's being reflected in prices? What's been reflected in prices so far, of course, has been just the higher, the, the build back in production this this summer to above the 102 BCF per day level, approaching 103. But that said, we did see production curtailments from both Chesapeake Energy and EQ, EQT Corp, which are the two largest natural gas producers in the U.S. in the spring. And when they did that, they did curtail a, a substantial amount and others followed suit. We did see some price rallies in, in May and June. Both Chesapeake and EQT so far in early in during uh, I'm sorry Chesapeake and EQT have both discussed in, in recent memory here uh, Chesapeake this week about the potential for uh, curtailing more or returning to curtailments in the fall that could help uh, support prices in the fall particularly if we get that uh, heat extending deep in into September and potentially into October as AccuWeather is forecasting. So that would be the, sort of the near-term projections on that. But as you said, with the expected LNG demand coming later this year and extending through the decade, potentially nearly doubling LNG demand by the end of the decade, producers are expected to uh, keep any curtailments in, in sort of short-term uh, windows. Chesapeake said this week that it would be ready to bring back any curtailed production by the end of the year in anticipation of that LNG demand. So it's probably... Uh, what we saw in the spring and summer where we saw near-term impacts from curtailments helping prices and then in the summer bringing that production back on hurting prices uh, there's the potential for a repeat of that in the fall and the winter but the big difference of course in the winter would be the uh, that uh, coming lng demand so if that starts coming through quickly and sopping up a lot of the excess supply that jody talked about you could definitely see a rally into the winter the other big thing though is that there's wide expectations for it to be a La Nina winter, which often means a relatively mild winter in the south, but it tends to mean a cold 
and wet winter in the northern U.S. as well as Canada. And when obviously the cold would drive elevated levels of heating demand, uh, the wet part of that would be snow, and snow would seem tends to trap in the cold and, and extend the winter. So there's the potential in the north as well as Canada for there to be a long cold winter. And if that happens, uh, of course, demand would eat up a lot of that um, excess supply as well. So uh, when we look at our at forward prices, just taking a, a look at uh, fixed forward fixed prices, Henry Hub, just as an example, NGI data show prices this winter comfortably above the three dollar level, and that extending into next summer as well. And then when you look at other parts of the country, just individually, I mean, you're, you're seeing prices as much as you know, more than doubling that. So th there is a lot of expectation for both the LNG and the potential for a protracted winter to have a, bi a bullish impact on prices this coming winter and beyond. Right. Well, yeah, I saw some of the forward prices and I saw even north of $7, I believe, in the Northeast. So that region obviously is not they're accustomed to the cold weather and so they're accustomed to the strong demand and now with you know all of the um competing demand sectors you know obviously they're baking in that risk of a cold winter chris do you have anything to add on that i know you kind of when you're covering the daily market you're seeing some of these uh gyrations in the market kind of in real time and so do you have anything to layer on there yeah just to echo what Kevin was saying that it's been kind of a, a mixed bag in terms of the market reaction to what the producers have said this earnings season. You know, CNX and Range Resources indicated they were unlikely to make further production concessions, uh, while EQT and Chesapeake have both baked in, continuing the curtailments until the market. They said uh, Chesapeake said they were watching fundamentals, but uh, as well as price before they would bring back output. Uh, and we saw the market on uh, July 30th uh, respond, uh, break out of its uh, downtrend, respond favorably to that. And uh, yeah, in terms of day to day, it just seems like the market is really paying attention to the direction of production and what these producers are saying. Uh, you know, Freeport was back online, but it seemed like the market was like, that's nice. Uh, I'm, I'm following production right now. So that seems to be top of mind. Yeah. Well, there's certainly a lot of variables that could dramatically alter the trajectory for natural gas prices. I mean, just like we've seen this year, you know, with the, the storm outages and the prolonged outages at, at Freeport. So, of course, then, Kevin, as you mentioned, the winter season alone, I mean, that carries its own risks. Um, if we do see a particularly cold winter up north, there's the potential for freeze offs to occur. And of course, that would curb production. But even here on the Gulf Coast, even if it's it's expected to be a warm winter. We've always got the issue of fog in that January, February timeframe. So that could cause issues for LNG exports. Of course, right when demand is highest. Thank you for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and comment to support the channel. See you in the next one.